thank you all for joining us today at the Valeno Smith Museum of Anthropology. Um, I'm William Nitsky. I'm the co-director of the museum. Well, I'm Georgia Fox, and I'm chair of the anthropology department and also co-director of the museum. And welcome. We're happy to see you. Hi, I'm Adrienne Scott. I'm the curator here at the museum. I am Heather McCafferty. I'm the assistant curator at the museum. Hi, everybody. My name is Drew Sullivan Hames. I'm a staff assistant at the museum. Well, you've just met our museum team. Um, and before we get started actually into the virtual tour, I want to uh, talk to you about uh, a few things with the, the Zoom platform that we're using just to make sure everyone understands how it works. Um, if you move your mouse over the window that you're seeing in front of you, and you'll see a gallery view of people's faces, you should be seeing a gallery view of people's faces, lots of little uh, Hollywood squares, if you will. Um, if you move your mouse to the very top right, uh, you'll see it is in speaker view or in gallery view. Um, as we start, when we start the virtual tour, um, I encourage you to switch it to speaker view so you'll be able to see uh, our two curators of our exhibition and how and when they speak to us. Um, also, I want to point your attention to if you move your mouse at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of icons. It will say mute, stop video, chat. If you click on the chat icon, you'll have a little window that will pop up and you'll be able to input and ask any questions or comments that you may have. Um, and those questions and comments will be addressed after we finish the virtual tour, okay? If for some reason you don't feel comfortable or feel worried that you don't really know how to operate the chat function, please just hold your questions if you can to the end and we'll field your questions uh, when we open up to Q&A. One last thing I do want to uh, state is that uh, because we're all here in this virtual world, um, there is a potential for audio disturbance. And so what I would like you all to do, if you could now, uh, and we'll make sure that this happens, of course, of, uh, throughout the virtual tour, that people mute themselves. So if you can, if you haven't already, move your mouse to the very bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom window and click on mute. You'll know that you are muted because you'll see a little, you'll see actually a, a red line go right through that mute icon. So without any further ado, let's begin. Hmm. All right, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the museum to give uh, like today's uh, exhibit tour context. And so um, a, a little bit about our museum studies program here at Ch CSU Chico. Um, we are one of the few museology programs in the United States uh, that offers hands-on training in museum work with a dedicated museum laboratory. So our the museum is in a sense a laboratory, but it's also a, a museum. Um, the Museum of Anthropology was established in 1970 uh, to support the unique and innovative museum training program. So now we're 50 years old into this program. And today, uh, the Valain L. Smith Museum of Anthropology functions as a teaching museum and multifaceted educational facility where students can see uh, research design and install exhibits as part of their formal training uh, and where the campus community and general public can learn about the diversity of human cultures and experiences through our exhibitions. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, in our museum studies program, students also gain hands-on experiences through courses such as collections management, artifact conservation, museum education, and museum administration. And our museum hosts three exhibitions a year, curated by museum staff and faculty and trained graduate and undergraduate students. The exhibition we'll be viewing today is called Unbroken Traditions, Basket Weavers of the Meadows Baker Families of Northern California. Video? Yes. Um, well, I don't see the, the picture. Oh, there we go. I really yeah. Okay. Hold on one second, please. We acknowledge and are mindful that CSU Chico stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta, 
and we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. We are humbled that our campus resides upon sacred lands that once sustained the Machupka people for centuries. We would like to thank Dr. Don Hankins, Miwok, Susan Campbell, Mountain Maidu, and Rachel McBride Pretorius Yurok, Director of Tribal Relations, CSU Chico, for their work as consultants for this exhibit. Their information they shared has been invaluable to our research. We would also like to thank Dr. Vanessa Esquivito, Norrell Mook Wintu Hoopa and Hikana, Assistant Professor of Multicultural Gender Studies at CSU Chico. Thanks to Heather Martin, Assistant State Archaeologist, State Archaeological Collections Research Facility, California Department of Parks and Recreation. And now I'm going to hand it over to Adrian Scott, who was integral to the exhibit curation process. We worked with the student curators together on the research design and installation of this very special exhibit. Foremost in our work was collaborating with our consultants and working to be mindful as we applied a museum process of decolonization. Adrian has more to share on this subject. We would be remiss at this celebration not to acknowledge the troubled history museums have had with Native Americans and other indigenous peoples around the world. In fact, many anthropology museums are directly linked to a history of colonization of Native American cultures. Curators still today can be guilty of superior attitudes that perpetuate deep historic divisions and oppression of Native Americans, African Americans, immigrants, and other marginalized groups. By treating cultural objects as scientific specimens or only using tribal members as informants, museums support systemic injustices. We aspire here to model for our students, our public, our other museums, a collaborative style that allows omitted voices to come forward. History is always in motion and we aim to shed light on stories that have not been told or have been purposely avoided, even expunged. We must acknowledge and expose these biases. We work to keep an open mind and build deeper connections with many communities in the North State. We hope to be a place that will bridge gaps and omissions in our collective histories. Now I'd like to introduce uh, the two graduate students who have been engaging in this work with us, Coral Doyle and Megan Sims. They are both beginning their third year here and undertook the Broken, Unbroken Traditions exhibit with us. Coral has a background in archeology span and has focused her museum work on collections management and care. Her current area of interest and thesis topic is on developing sustainable practices for museums. Megan's background is actually in English, but has had to learn the tenets of anthropology to embrace the museum studies program at Chico State. Her focus is in educational programming, not just giving tours, but also writing curriculum. Megan and Coral represent the future of museums. In their lifetimes, so much will change in how museums tell stories and respond to their communities. While we prepare them for this new world, they inform us on what is most pressing in their minds. This is how we stay as an institution relevant and dynamic. Hi everyone. So before we begin the actual tour of the exhibit, Coral and I wanted to share how we prepared for it. We began the process in April of 2019 by having a few meetings with Adrian, Heather, and Dr. Fox to understand the theme and the scope of the exhibit. We also established a timeline for when every aspect of it should be completed. With the help from our consultants, we established the baskets that would be used in the exhibit hoping to represent as many of the basket makers as possible and share the beautiful basket work. Once the baskets were loaned to the Val L. Smith Museum of Anthropology, Megan and I began completing condition reports and photographing the collection for managing the care and status of the objects for the duration of the loan. Dr. Brian Brazil, a professor of anthropology, gave Megan and I a lesson in photography to take clear photographs that would show the details of the baskets. We paid attention to lighting and background. This is a close-up example of our photographic work, a small basket made by Polly Jackson. We also assigned temporary loan accession numbers to maintain provenience. 
We worked with our consultants to compile a list of information on the baskets we used for the exhibit. This included the natural materials used, such as redbud or willow, and it also included the basket makers, if known, and the use of the basket. Next, we began researching and writing the labels. The writing process took a while and included multiple drafts. Many people, including Dr. Fox, Adrian, Heather, and our consultants, looked over our drafts to make sure they were accurate. This process also included um, uh, designing the labels. And Coral and I had some experience with this process um, for the museum's Remarkable Lives exhibit. But for this one, instead of creating a few labels, we had to create all of them. In designing the space, we really wanted to make the exhibit feel open and autonomous by utilizing as much of the North Gallery as possible. We established large cases throughout the space to draw visitors to different points of the room and to provide enough display space to exhibit the basket work. We decided to place an L-shaped wall in the middle of the room to create a divide, offer more wall space for the baskets and labels, and to create a circular flow throughout the room. We chose a color story of red, blue, and green to bring natural colors to, into the space, providing warmth while complementing the baskets. Bringing our vision of life through the painting and arranging the space was definitely our favorite part. One of the interactives we created was this basket materials quiz. At first, we weren't quite sure what type of interactive we should create, but after doing some research, we drew up a general design. Then we created a mock-up out of foam core to determine the size and dimensions. We purchased the wood and then started building. Coral and I helped cut the wood, but my grandpa, Craig Tavis, pretty much built the rest of it. He did allow me to help with some things like staining the wood, but otherwise he did everything else. We are so, so thankful for him and all of his hard work. Later in the tour, we will see the finished interactive and how it works. In order to figure out how much wall space we need for each label, Coral and I created mock-ups. This technique also helped us design the labels. Here is an example of how um, I organized the family tree section. Since there were multiple labels and photos for this section, I wanted to make sure everything was organized in an easy to read way. As we can see here, I created a few ideas as to how the section should be organized, but ultimately chose to arrange the photos in an ascending design with the genealogy chart in the center. Thinking of the design and display of the vinyl titles used throughout the exhibit, we wanted to choose a simple and large font for ease of reading. We also worked with creative media technologies on campus and utilized photographs from the Miriam Library Special Collections to enlarge. We chose two images of Lily Baker, not only because she's a loved and influential person in the community, but to increase the presence of the basket makers in the exhibit. This image here is printed on the plastic sheet and held up by fishing line in the lobby of the museum while the previous image was printed on Tyvek and hung by a dowel. We were also involved in choosing the poster for the exhibit. There were two designs to choose from, but we decided on this poster because it emphasized the importance of the Meadows Baker family. The exhibit opened September 18th and we had a really good turnout despite the rain. Coral and I are so thankful for everyone who attended and for everyone who helped with the entire creation process. We would not have been able to, to do it without you. Basketry is a dynamic cultural tradition for many indigenous peoples in California. Through basketry, the basket maker expresses talent, cultural traditions and values, ecological knowledge, artistic vision, personal, familial, and tribal history and more. For many Native American groups in California, baskets continue to play an integral role in the ceremonies and daily life. Prior to California statehood and for many years after, California Indians were forcibly removed from their lands and separated from their children through genocidal legislation and the indenturing of individuals as property. Many children were placed in boarding schools and Native Americans were forced to give up their traditions such as language, basket making, and other spiritual and ceremonial traditions. 
Through all this devastating intergenerational trauma, vital traditions such as basket making, ceremonies, and language, to name a few, continue today. Many of the baskets on display in this exhibit were made by Mountain Maidu women of the Meadows Baker families, spanning multiple generations. Other baskets on display show traditions from Northern California, such as Miwok and Atsugewe. Each basket is unique and reveals the basket maker's personal and cultural connections to the land. The resiliency, artistry, and wisdom of the Meadows Baker families are illustrated in the baskets in this exhibition. Displayed is a map of California with pins placed in the northern region to show the general areas of which individuals from the Meadows Baker family have lived. Each pin represents a different area. Red, Indian Valley, yellow, Taylorsville. Green, Genesee Valley. Blue, Big Meadows and Lake Almanor. Black, Honey Lake Valley. The Meadows Baker families mainly comprise men and women of the Mountain Maidu. We were able to include the Meadows Baker family genealogy chart, which shows four generations of basket weavers. Pictured here are five women from the family who were master weavers. The pictures ascend or descend depending on how you look at them generationally. On the left, we see a photo of Lily Baker, then her mother, Daisy Meadows Baker, and then Daisy's mother, Kate Meadows McKinney. And on the other side, we see Rose Meadows Salem, Daisy's sister, then Selena Jackson Young, who is related to the Meadows Baker family through the marriage of her adopted son, Herb Young. Herb married Lily's older sister, Jenny, and although he was not a basket weaver, he is known for preserving and supporting Maidu cultural traditions. The, mast the master weavers pictured here drew from a large understanding of ecology, harvesting, and processing natural materials and intricate weaving techniques. Baskets are light. They do not break easily and are efficient for numerous tasks. The most common techniques for creating basketry are coiling and twining plant materials. Under each of these techniques, different variations exist. Baskets also have what is known as a work face. The work face is the side of the basket that is held toward the weaver as they work. The work face always ends up as the smoother, most finished side of the basket. When looking at twine baskets, they are made of warps, which radiate outward like spokes and wefts that bind the warps together. Warps are the sticks that provide structure to the basket, whereas the wefts are used to secure the sticks in place. Wefts comprise the material that is sewn around the foundation or interior of a basket. Here is an example of a twine basket made by Kate Meadows McKinley. With coiled baskets, they are made with a foundation that spirals from the base to the rim. These may be made by coiling the plant material counterclockwise or clockwise, depending on the design of the basket, tribal tradition, or a basket weaver's preference. Here is an example of a coiled basket made by Jenny Meadows. Here is also an image of a basket interactive that I thought would help visitors understand how one would, could twine the spokes of a basket by using the strings provided. I used a Lazy Susan and popsicle sticks to create the base to weave rope around. Here is my stepdad giving it a try at the opening of the exhibit. Now another important aspect of the basket making are tools. Here's an example of tools that were traditionally used by Lily Baker. 
Her toolkit was comprised of a modern awl, traditional bone awl, sewing scissors, a pocket knife, and a stone. Lily also created a special tool by punching various holes into a spoon. This tool was used to size the plant material to be used in her baskets. By pulling plant material through the spoon, it allowed Lily to have consistently sized pieces to create tightly woven baskets. The image you see here is of Lily working with a basket. The Kit Carts collection shows the versatility of basket weaving in creating many types of baskets. The baskets in this case include a cradle board and hat, along with storage, comb, and creel baskets. Coral and I wanted to display as many baskets as possible in a tasteful way. The rock design for this case and our other large case was inspired by a museum in Columbia State Historic Park in Columbia, California. Here is a close-up of a twined creel basket made by Daisy Meadows Baker. We learned from our consultants that th this is a smaller version of a creel basket that held fish. And here we can see a coiled storage basket and its lid. It is made of hazel, willow, maiden hair, and pine root. The cradle board created by Lily Baker is a much smaller version of a regular cradle board. This particular cradle board was created for Kit Kurtz's dolls. It is made of willow or choke cherry. In the background, we can see the hat. It is beautifully woven and provides another example of how basket weaving can be used. It is made of tule and either mud dyed bulrush or mud dyed tule. The film that you see here, Bound to Tradition, produced by Alba, brings the perspectives of the local basket makers to the exhibit. Dr. Don Hankins Miwok discusses the importance of traditional ecological knowledge, and Susan Campbell, Mountain Maidu, discusses the, the tradition of cradle boards and finding a balance between traditional ways with modern society. The full film can be accessed on the museum website, but the link is also provided here in the chat. Lily Baker once said, when you weave a design into a basket, you put the spirit of what you are weaving right into the basket. No two baskets are alike, and the same can be said about basket weavers. The butterfly baskets displayed here were created by Rose Meadows Salem, Daisy's sister, Daisy Meadows Baker, and Lily Baker. Notice the, uh, notice the differences among all three baskets. Although these baskets were started with a tight spiral, the tension and butterfly designs are unique to the individual basket weavers. Acorns collected from oak trees have been a staple of California indigenous diets for over 4,000 years. The stewardship of oak woodlands frequently involved the intentional use of prescribed fires, which allowed native peoples to enhance oak distribution and abundance to create a more stable oak environment. This is an example of traditional ecological knowledge being used to manage this vital resource. Of the more than 20 varieties of acorn species in California, the most widely used by the Maidu include tambark oak, black oak, blue oak, and valley oak. Within this case, there are baskets that may be used in the gathering of plant material, the processing of acorns for cooking and for storage. With acorn processing, one of the first steps is in the process is the collection and storage of the various types of acorns. They are collected in the autumn and dried in the sun before storage and use. Burden baskets are used to carry heavy loads on one's back while smaller gathering baskets are handheld. Seed beaters are also used alongside burden baskets to shake plant seeds into the basket, such as the one you see here, made by Lily Baker, made of willy, willow. The acorns can then be prepared for cooking by cracking the shell and removing the kernels which are ground into flour using stone slabs and mortar hoppers. 
Winnowing trays are used to toss seeds in the air, allowing the wind to remove outer husk and eliminate unwanted material from being collected. This tray was made by Kate Meadows McKinley. Cooking baskets or feast baskets are used to boil acorn mush with cooking stones and stir sticks. This image is a member of the Maidu indigenous group cooking in a large cooking basket, basket using hot stones. Gathering plant materials for making baskets is part of what is referred to as traditional ecological knowledge or tech. It consists of gaining intimate knowledge of one's surrounding natural environment, knowledge that is passed from generation to generation of indigenous practitioners. Unfortunately, traditional or sacred lands used for retrieving materials for baskets or used for ceremonial purposes have been impacted by pesticides, structures, logging, mining, flooding, displacement, and restricted or prohibited access. But still, traditions have endured and local mountain Maidu have formed the Maidu Cultural and Developmental Group, a nonprofit organization that encourages coordination with the U.S. Forest Service to recognize and work with the Maidu as land stewards. The materials you see here are on loan from Dr. Don Hankins. They are some of the common materials used in basket making, such as redbud, sedge, sourberry, and willow. Here is the finished product of the Plant Materials Interactive that we mentioned earlier. We created it to be like a quiz where the top part of each pull tab, tab includes a few characteristics of four different plant materials used to create the baskets. The name and photo of the plants appear when the tab is pulled. Repairs are made by Native Americans and museum conservators, but in different ways that both uphold the integrity of the basket. Traditional repairs consist of a patchwork of additional wefts to the broken portion of the basket, as you can see here on the close-up of the winnowing tray made by Kate Meadows McKinley. Trained museum conservators repair baskets in a way that supports the structure but can be reversed for the preservation of the basket. This can be done by using Japanese tissue paper and wheat starch paste, which lends support while minimizing pressure on the basket. We were fortunate to have found this documentary called Dancing with the Bear, Lily Baker and the Maidu Legacy in the Chico State Miriam Library. It includes interviews with Lily Baker and other members of the Maidu tribe. Although Lily Baker never came, or came sorry, from a long line of skilled Maidu basket weavers, her first attempt at making a basket did not go well. Frustrated, Lily threw out her basket. Her father later found the discarded basket, repaired it, and gave it back to her to finish. Lily went on to become a skilled basket weaver and taught classes on weaving alongside her mother, Daisy. Lily was a natural teacher and worked well with adults and children. Lily once observed that, quote, when some people look at me, I feel like I am just a basket. They don't ever see me, just only baskets, end quote. There was much more to Lily than her basketry skills. She and her mother, Daisy, also served as Maidu cultural consultants. Lily passed away on November 3, 2006, in Greenville, California. She walked two worlds, contemporary life and that of a traditional, culture, or traditional Maidu woman, but her role as a teacher remained clear. Lily Baker never had any children of her own, but her legacy still lives on. Her students, Denise Davis and Shawea Peck, who are both Mountain Maidu, have continued to weave baskets and teach others about basket making. Sue Campbell, Mountain Maidu and Marlene Montgomery Pitt Rivers, who were taught by Denise Davis, have also become teachers and advocates regarding the art of basketry. Also, the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, or SEBA, was created to unite current Native American basket weavers and to increase awareness of basketry in California. They graciously allowed us to use some of their photos in our exhibit. The efforts of individual people and associations like SEBA will help secure and sustain the traditional art of basketry far into the future. To close, we would like to share this quote from Lily Baker. She said, quote, I never know what the design of the basket will be when I start. 
It just happens. It is the Maidu in me coming through my fingers, end quote. The baskets on display in this exhibition were generously loaned to the Val Lanel Smith Museum of Anthropology by the Kurtz family for the duration of this ex exhibition. Images in this presentation are from the Kurtz family photography collection, otherwise, unless otherwise noted. Well, thank you so much, uh, Megan Sims and Coral Doyle. Very, very well done. Um, the two of you did just a wonderful job um, explaining the entire exhibition to us and also creating a professional exhibition at the Valena Smith Museum of Anthropology. The whole museum team are so proud of your work and I, I, I might be able to speak for everyone here. I think it was just what just a wonderful experience for you to take us through the hard work that you put into this exhibition. Thank you again. Um, I want to just remind everybody before we go into the next segment, um, you can put any of your questions or comments into the chat and we'll address them very shortly. Um, before we do, I'd like to uh, introduce two consultants uh, that work very closely with us uh, for this exhibition. Um, uh, I'm gonna first introduce uh, Rachel McBride uh, Pretorius, uh, who is our Chico State Campus Tribal Liaison. Rachel, are you there? I am. Would you like to say a few words? Um, I just wanna say thank you The Megan and Coral did such a fantastic job and it was really nice that the local native community were included from the very beginning. And it's an interesting situation. There's, you know, longstanding histories between museums and native communities, but I have to say, um, we have a wonderful working relationship with the museum, all of the staff, Adrian and Heather. And so it's just very, they're all very thoughtful and it is nice to work with them and they're all very inclusive. So I just wanna really thank them for including us and we, are, we love the display. It was so wonderful to have our community come in and say, especially family members or descendants of Lily Baker to be able to really see the work and for our elders to come in and see the display and the exhibit. It was, um, it was a wonderful thing to be a part of. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Vanessa Escovedo. She is an assistant professor in uh, uh, Chico State, uh, California State University, Chico, uh, in the uh, Department of Multicultural and Gender Studies. Vanessa, would you like to say some, some words to us? Yeah, Hestam, y'all. Um, so glad to be here and what a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm actually right now located on Miwok and Maidu and East Mountain lands. And yeah, you know, I come from an anthropology background and ethnic studies from Sac State. So Professor Castaneda was actually my professor and I learned a lot of the museum studies from her. So <laughs> happy to see her. And um, yeah, coming as a new professor, brand new <laughs> to Chico State, you know, like you never know what you're gonna get when you get to the place you're going and like how they deal with things. And honestly, seeing the anthropology museum, I knew how closely Professor Castaneda worked with the Native community, but you know, I was a bit worried coming in, like I didn't know. And then Rachel instantly was like, no, these are good people. They work with the Native community. And I've seen that throughout the process. And I think that's so fantastic because it makes the experience so much more um, detailed and you know, uh, it makes us wanna come to those things. And I think that coming into that museum space and allowing me to actually touch the baskets without freaking out, I came from UC Davis before where they're like, you need to put the white gloves on, don't touch them. And, you know, our baskets are intimate parts of our, you know, being, our relationships with the land and uh, our ancestors and our people who, who create basketry. And for me to be able to touch it and feel it and sing for them um, was fantastic. And uh, I really love uh, the student workers working on, these, on this project. Y'all did a fantastic job. So I really appreciate it. 
Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, it means so much to us to hear um, your words and also uh, to have you deeply involved in, in everything we do. Um, it's really, really important to us um, and the Museum of Anthropology and our museum team. Um, what I'd like to do now uh, is I'd like it to open it up to questions or comments. Um, I'm going to ask Drew Sullivan Haynes uh, over here if anything has come up in the chat first. Yeah, we do have a question that came up in the chat recently. Uh, Julia Roth was wondering if there's any local people who can teach basket weaving. And it's not addressed to anybody in particular, but uh, someone who's informed, uh, please uh, chime in. I think that uh, for, uh, excuse me, if anyone else wants to speak. Please. Um, because of this huge break uh, of, of separating Native peoples and our experience with um, learning how to basket weave, uh, I wouldn't say that it's just open just to everyone. I think that it's really awesome to appreciate that artwork and, and to honor it. Um, but unless you are Native, uh, to learn from your, your community. Um, I do want to say, though, it is, because uh, I don't know who wrote the comment, maybe you are Native, so forgive me. Um, I know I've just took a virtual class, right? I mean, Native people in contemporary, are contemporary beings. I just took a virtual class from Susan Campbell. <laughs> so, I mean, learning basket weave over Zoom, I mean, I don't know how contemporary you can get, but <laughs> I, I just wanted to offer that, if anyone else wants to add. I will just add that if you are, if whoever put it in the chat, if they are native to reach out to us and, um, and we could probably get you with some, connect you with some resources and people. Drew, any other questions? I haven't seen any other questions. There's a lot of people um, thanking us and we're so grateful that you guys enjoyed the presentation and that you were able to take the time to, to join us. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if anyone like to, uh, you don't have to use the chat, you can certainly just unmute yourself. You go down to the very bottom left of your Zoom screen and you'll see the little icon with a microphone. You can unmute yourself and you can ask a question uh, and we can hear your question. Uh, Eddie Vela just asked a question here in the chat. Um, what will happen to the baskets after the exhibit is over? I can answer that quickly. Just uh, the, the baskets uh, are uh, on loan um, and uh, they, are, they, they are an extended loan because of COVID right now. And we have benefited by being able to make this virtual tour, but the baskets will return to uh, the Kurtz family who currently own this collection. Eddie says, thanks, Adrian. Uh, looks like uh, Kimberly Whitfield asked also a question, is the work face of the basket based on the type of basket or is it a basket weaver's preference? Um, I know I discussed this in the, um, in the tour, but I was just wondering, I wanted to open up to um, any of the basket makers and see if you had um, anything to say on that matter because I'm, I'm sure because I'm not an expert on this and I'm sure you'd be able to provide more information. Well from what um, I have read and the uh, research I've done um, I've learned that the basket that the work face um, is um, it, it could dip, I think it's like it's just like the way that you hold the basket when you're weaving, and so um, typically the most finished side is like is the work face. I think I believe, and so yeah. Thanks, Coral. I think Vanessa was going to jump in there. Is that oh. correct, I, Vanessa? Yeah, I mean, if someone else wants to go. I heard someone else's voice, maybe. No, that was uh, going to well, say we was... could welcome Linda oh, Yamane Linda. is here as well, <laughs> expert basket weaver throughout California. Welcome, thank you for coming today. Hi, thank you. Um, I decided not to have myself on video just because <laughs> I'm doing something else and not that you know maybe video presentable. But I just wanted to comment that yes, the work face um, would be recognizable whether it's 
uh, coiled or twined by the clean look, by the regularity of the stitches, especially in um, coiled weaving, because um, all of the tail ends, whether it's the beginning of the weaving strand or the end, have to be concealed in some way or another. And um, so, of course, that's you know normally going to be done in the back, especially with the um, the piece of the weaving strand that is left at when you reach its end. So, and and likewise with twining, I mean, you've got the ends of your weft, your weaving pieces that you have to do something with, and so. Basically, it's what's been said already, but I just wanted to um, uh, verify that it, in coiling and twining, basically all of kind of, like if you, were, if you wanted to compare it to sewing, for example, you're probably not going to have your hem folded to the outside. And likewise, everyone's trying to put the most beautiful face forward, and that is so in basketry. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah, thank sure. you, Linda. Uh, we have another question um, from Dina Welch. Uh, she says, great job. I came in late and I want to know, how can you tell an authentic basket from one that might be made today? I guess um, my question would be, uh, you mean like if it's by native made by native people or not because i think that i mean we we baskets today so i would consider those authentic um but if you're talking about more of a um i mean maybe compared to like baskets you see around other places is that what you're kind of asking um to differentiate uh, but i would say probably materials you know where those materials are collected uh, a lot of times you can tell that they are authentic or native made by the materials um, from the specific lands. So not like, you know, the wicker baskets and stuff like that can sometimes really, you know, imitate a uh, native looking basketry, mm -hmm. but that's just one little. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. And I see yeah, that. I just was going to oh. add that the, the idea of authenticity um, is kind of problematic sometimes and um, I know it stems back to somehow how we've been taught in schools, but um, the idea that Native Americans um, only had a certain time, they are still here. And, and that, that is the message we try to bring in our museum and, and um, as an ally to Native Americans, we really wanna make sure that that is understood. So authenticity really continues today. Thank you for that clarification. Um, there is actually a question from Vanessa herself uh, to direct it towards Megan and Coral. She asked, uh, how was it reaching out to the Native community? Was it difficult or easy? Such an important piece to discuss with working uh, to include Native voices. So I can start that one. Um, so um, it was actually pretty easy. Um, Heather and um, Adrian reached out to um, Rachel and, and um, the other people who helped helped us, and um, and since they were actually just right down the hall from the um, anthropology museum, that was really it was really great. Um, so um, yeah, we appreciated like so they read our our um, tables to make sure that all of that that information was um, accurate, and um, and they also made sure that um, our exhibit. Um, once it was finished was accurate as well. And so that was really great because um, something that's a really hot topic that I'm actually um, re researching right now is about, um, de de sorry, decolonization. And so, um, which we talked a little bit about before. Um, and so that's allowing um, the people who um, are talked about in um, these um, uh, museum exhibits have a voice in what is told about them. So that was really important to us. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Karen Williams has a question. I'm concerned about baskets taken from Mountain Maidu burials and sold in the black market. Is anyone familiar with this?
uh, just a basic thing. I don't have a familiarity with the specific question uh, about specific burials, but uh, in general, it is illegal uh, and is covered under the Repatriation Act of uh, NAGPRA um, of uh, 1993. And anything in any museum that is associated with any funerary burial context uh, is uh, a process exists to repatriate why, while it has not been completed and it is only beginning. And the concept of repatriation has uh, evolved in, to include beyond the burial context. But um, that's just sort of a very brief uh, underlined of, of what NAGPRA is, but there's more to that story. I'd like to speak to this. Um, <laughs> something I talk about in my collections class, and that is a black market looting of, of artifacts is a, is a terrible problem. And um, it's difficult to control because <clears throat> you see uh, these things being sold on eBay. Uh, they sometimes they enter into the market through um, the auction houses like Sotheby's and Christie's. Um, I always try to discourage my students from pursuing hey. jobs <laughs> in those venues um, because there are questionable means in which um, these things um, make, in, make it into not only the black market, but the legitimate market. So um, the way to tell, it's hard to tell. Um, the only thing is we have to be really vigilant. Um, if we suspect anything that looks like it's been part of the black market or part of looting and grave robbing, then we need to report it. Um, the question is, where do you report it? So you can start with us here at Chico State and we can guide you uh, to where to go, but um, this is an ongoing issue. Um, and it's not just for um, Native American baskets, it's for antiquities in general worldwide. It's a, global, it's a global issue and one that's not going away. And one of the things that really drives um, this are some collectors who um, surreptitiously um, get their uh, objects from the black market because they're looking for them. Um, there are legitimate collectors too, but there are, there are black market collectors and so um, it's a very shady business. Um, it's deeply entrenched. And I really appreciate that you asked this question because we do really need to be aware of this. Thanks. And also the museum and most reputable museums do not buy artifacts. Thank you, Georgia and Adrian. Um, Kimberly Whitfield in the chat has a suggestion for Megan. She says, check out the work that the Museum of Man in San Diego is doing on, on decolonizing their organization. That sounds interesting. And that is everything that I see in the chat for now. Anybody anyone else have any other questions? Does any, yeah, does anyone want to ask a question not in the chat? Mm -hmm. you just unmute yourself and ask a question openly. Will, um, Heather here. Sure. Um, I had a question for the two student curators. I wanted to ask them how this experience um, was for you, how you feel it articulates with your overall museum education and how it might help you in your, your future career. Um, I can start with this one. Um, so, I feel like it helped um, me and me a lot with understanding like the importance of connecting with your community and um, bringing the perspectives of individuals into the exhibit because um, it just helps create a more accurate and um, just like a more um, accurate ex exhibition and just something that um, more personal someone can like um, connect with more. Um, I also gain a lot of skills in design with label making and the exhib exhibition space. And I think the, one of the most things I took away from this whole experience was the importance of organization. Because uh, I had a lot of instances where I wasn't being proactively organized and um, I it just like double my work later. So I, all these things like really helped me in those like, yeah, that aspect of my work. <laughs> Yeah, and then I pretty much have like the same experience. Um, one thing that came after um, everything was done was I helped create um, the activities for um, uh, field trips and, and whatnot. And, and that was a really fun experience because then it, it helped me to um, see the things that we had made and, and the baskets and all of this um, important um, information from their understanding and um and so then that helped me to to better understand like how um 
how writing and how we portray um, information can be um, understood by a wider audience. Kimberly has her hand up. I always have all the questions. Go ahead. So I know you guys finished this before the COVID and the shutdown and all this stuff, but uh, the, one of the biggest things that my team and I are, are looking at with hands-on activities is what are we going to do now that we're never going to be able to touch anything ever again? <laughs> um, and basket weaving is like such a, you know, hands-on experience. Have you had any thoughts about that in the past couple of months about how maybe you would translate some of these things to like digital or like a, some way to create some type of physical learning experience that isn't, you know, so gross? <laughs> I think a lot of our world is in the process of changing and we don't fully understand or realize how those will be, um, uh, will be, you know, uh, we're, we're evolving even now, you know, Zoom seems sort of normal now, right? Um, so I do think that there will be a lot of hybrid in our future world. Um, and we may have more masks and other protective things too, but, but I think um, that there will be a time when we, you know, hands-on, you know, we, we will probably always have some aspects of that. Um, but many of our exhibits don't have so many hands-on things. Um, they might be more individualized, like when the tour comes that students have some one-on-one -on -one kind of activities to do. So we'll, we'll just kind of have to keep learning and growing as our world keeps changing. But good question. I'm just going to jump in. Um, hi, everybody, again. Um, Actually, if you, and I'll show you this later uh, in a few minutes, actually, um, but if you go to our museum website, uh, you'll be able to actually look at a virtual tour that was put together by Heather McCafferty. Um, this is not a video tour, but is actually a tour that you'll be able to go through on our website. And um, there is also uh, PDFs that you can download and also different materials that you can use as for educational materials. Um, so. I mean, of course, this is not involving the tactile nature that you're bringing up, Kimberly, but it is certainly something that can contribute to uh, the greater education of youth and individuals in our public. We have a, um, a, a library lending kit program called Museum in a Box, and uh, teachers have been coming to my driveway and checking them out, and we spray them down when they come back. <laughs> so it's still happening out there. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I had a question. Sure. Hi, I had a question about uh, the research. Were there any obstacles or any issues you had to overcome while you were conducting your research? Um, it was so long ago now, I'm, I, I, I'm having a blank. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm trying to think back and Overall, there weren't too many issues. Um, I feel like um, because we had a strong connection with our consultants, um, they were uh, so much help. It that helped us a lot with um, identifying like the like our re like if our research was correct, like what we were saying, like yeah, was appropriate. And um, you know, we we worked with the um, Miriam Library Special Collections. That was. And that was actually a really easy experience as well. They made it so easy for us to gain access to their materials. We went through a lot of things there, and um, overall, it was it, it overall it was pretty easy, like it, pretty smooth. And um, I can't think of anything that was a major hiccup. So, one of my big regrets is that we had a um, presentation, a, a, a basket demonstration uh, set up with uh, Sue Campbell and Shaiwea Peck. Uh, that was supposed to happen on March 25th. And so that is still in our minds, it is just temporarily on pause. And we will, regardless of what the topic of the exhibition is in the future, um, 
this will be still uh, integral and we hope that we can reconnect and, and uh, bring that back to the campus because it was going to be a really important event and, and it may not even take place within the museum itself, you know, because we can widen it up to the campus because it's that important. I'd like to chime in here. Um, the person that just asked that question, Elizabeth Rosales, she's our new um, graduate student that came in this fall and she's coming to a virtual uh, first year of graduate school, but we want to welcome her and she'll hopefully we'll show her opportunity as well to work on an exhibit. Um, I also want to mention too that Kimberly that Whitfield that was on just a while ago also came out of our uh, program, our undergraduate program, and went on to get her master's degree and so the JFK school and we're really proud of her. She now works at the Railroad Museum, has an important position there. So we're very proud of our alumni and also our new incoming graduate students as well as our undergraduates. So I just had to get that in there because I just want to do a shout out to some of, some of you in the audience. Speaking of shout outs, uh, Keith Johnson, you don't have a formal moment. We, we will save that for tomorrow, but if you wanted to say hello, we want to say hello to you. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Keith Johnson is the founder of the Museum Studies Program at California State University, Chico in 1970. It's an old guy. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Keith. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure. Very, very interesting. Very good. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow we'll be actually celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, and I encourage you all to check out our website. You will be able to register for that event as well. Uh, but before I talk about that, uh, Adrian, did you want to say a few words? Uh, remind me. <laughs> about our virtual tours. I was having such a good time, I forgot my role here. Yes, um, uh, we, uh, we are still conducting virtual tours, uh, not using this necessarily um, that you just saw, but we that's a live one. We have the one on our website and um, uh, teachers uh, have been contacting us and we can zoom into the classroom and talk about uh, the, the exhibit or other things that they might be borrowing from us for their classrooms. So we, we still have a presence in the educational community. Um, and we also are doing our um, Museum Monster Mayhem at the end of this month in a Zoom fashion as well. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, so what I'm showing everyone right in front of you, you should be able to see uh, is uh, the homepage of our museum website. Um, as you'll be able to see here, we have a variety of different events and programming that we have created for online access, for online accessibility, all free. Um, and we invite you all to check out these different programs. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, Monster Aham, we also have the virtual exhibit of Unbroken Traditions available. We also have a, a YouTube channel with different YouTube and educational videos, as well as what I mentioned before, our 50th anniversary celebration, which is tomorrow. And if you're interested on that, you can go to our website, click on this icon here, and it will take you to a registration page so that you can register and join us again tomorrow. Um, so to close on behalf of the entire museum team and the Museum of Anthropology here at Chico State, I wanna thank everyone for attending and I really wanna make sure that you have a wonderful rest of your day and especially a wonderful weekend. Thank you all for coming.